As we come to God's word, let's ask his help to understand it. Father, thank you for your word, a living word that speaks truth and gives life. Father, we pray that as we come to your word today, you would, uh, Lord, be speaking to each one of us where we're at. You know our hearts. May your Holy Spirit apply your word to us in just the way we need it. and Give us grace to respond to it, to hold on to it, to believe it, to be encouraged by it, and to be obedient to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Being pursued, um, being chased uh, by someone or something is the thing of nightmares, isn't it? Um, perhaps you've had those kind of dreams occasionally. Uh, you know, you're trying to escape from something. You're, you're trying to survive. Uh, at a critical moment, you wake up and you're feeling anxious and your heart is pounding and it takes some time to calm your mind and your body. It all seemed so real. It was just a dream but it all seemed so real. It's a nightmare because, you see, we don't like being chased. We don't like being pursued. We don't like having to flee from something, uh, from some danger. We don't like being pushed in a direction that we don't want to go. We don't like our freedom being threatened our well-being uh, being threatened. We don't like it in our dreams and we don't like it in real life either. For some, their conversion, their journey to faith in Jesus has been a pursuit. That's not my experience. Uh, I came to faith at the tender age of uh, seven. So I, I don't think I had a great sense of being pursued. Uh, but for some people it is. They're running from God and, and God is after them in a sense. Uh, in 1890, Francis Thompson described God's pursuit of him in the poem, The Hound of Heaven. And he writes of fleeing and hiding from God, hiding from those strong feet that followed, followed after. Speaking of his conversion, C.S. Lewis said, uh, you must picture me alone in that room at Magdalen College, night after night, feeling Whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Friends, we, we may not realise it, but actually being pursued by God is the reality for each of us. Just as it was for Francis Thompson and for C.S. Lewis, and just as we see in the book of Jonah, as we look at this first snapshot of Nineveh today, there are four distinctive truths that, that I want us to recognise up front about God's pursuit of us. 
The first is his pursuit is irresistible. His pursuit is irresistible. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Jesus doesn't say that all the Father gives me might come to me. He says they will come to me. J.A. Meadows um, puts it this way. He says his RSVPs on this invitation are always 100% yes. Friends, what assurance this gives us as we pray for people that God has laid upon our hearts because we see that his grace is irresistible. You see, human stubbornness and resistance can never withstand his pursuit and his inward, the inward call of his spirit on our lives. The second truth about his pursuit is this. Uh, we will never seek God unless he first pursues us. Not everyone is pursued by God. Um, Jesus says, all the Father gives me, come to me. The Father doesn't give everyone to Jesus, it's those he gives who come. Speaking of being born again to eternal life, Jesus said the wind, uh, a word that can also be translated spirit, the wind, the spirit, blows where, it's, where it wishes. That is, the object of God's salvation, the one who is saved, is the Holy Spirit's choice. It's a decision of the mind of the Godhead. And the reason for it is a mystery to us. God just doesn't tell us. But the wind blows where it wishes. The third truth is this. God's pursuit of us is the outflow of love from his heart in grace. He intends our good. Paul says to the Romans in chapter 8, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Some, a lot of believers read this and, and they think for no means uh, know something about. It, it's not what the word means in the original language. For no here has the sense of loving ahead of time. What is, Paul is saying is those whom God loved ahead of time, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And so we see the pursuit of Francis Thompson's uh, hand, hounds of heaven is not for our destruction, but it's for our rescue, our salvation, our eternal good. And Francis Thompson actually finally realised this. The poem ends with these words uh, that he records, God speaking to him. God says, and human love needs and human love needs human meriting. How hast thou merited? Whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee? Save me, save only me. And friends, in reality, that's true of all of us. There's no merit in us that attracts God's love. The reason for God's love for us is in him, not in us. His pursuit of us, which, which comes from the outflow of his heart in love, is pure grace, undeserved. And friends, it's this grace that pursued Jonah, and it's this grace that pursued the people of Nineveh, and it's this grace that we want to focus our thoughts on this morning. There's a fourth truth uh, 
I'm sure there's probably more, but this is the last one I want to mention. His pursuing grace goes where we don't expect it to go and even where we don't want it to go. You see, it's God's choosing where his grace goes, not ours. And that was Jonah's big problem. You're probably familiar with the story of Jonah. Um, There we go, point four. You're probably familiar with the story of Jonah. He was called by God to preach judgment against the city of Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh was a city of of the rising Assyrian Empire. Uh, Its people had a reputation for being fierce and merciless, and they were the enemies of Israel. Uh, Within decades of, of Jonah's journey to Nineveh, Samaria would be conquered and the northern kingdom of Israel would be exiled. And perhaps just over half a century uh, later, Sennacherib would march from Nineveh against Jerusalem in a failed attempt to conquer it when Hezekiah was king. And it's to this fierce people that God instructs Jonah to go and deliver a message of judgment. But instead of obeying God, Jonah hopped on a ship to flee in the opposite direction. Um, We're told that he fleed to Tarshish. Um, Yeah, we're still on that map. Uh, Tarshish is so far away, um, it's not even on the map. Tarshish is way off the other side of the Mediterranean Sea in southern Spain. Jonah was meant to take a land journey to Nineveh. He jumps on a ship and heads across the other side of the Mediterranean. Jonah fled. Why? Why why did he go in the opposite direction? It wasn't because he liked the Ninevites and thought God was being cruel to them. Uh, They were Israel's enemies. Jonah hated them. It's a task, perhaps, that would make him nervous, understandably. But Jonah doesn't flee because he's scared of the people of Nineveh. We actually find out the reason towards the end of the book when Jonah prays to the Lord. Uh, We read it in chapter 4 and verse 2. There Jonah says, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Why did Jonah run the opposite direction? Because he feared God's grace would go where Jonah did not want it to go. And so he ran. In his heart, Jonah thought the people of Nineveh were not deserving of God's grace. But friends, isn't that why it's grace? It's undeserved. Otherwise, it would stop being grace, wouldn't it? Uh, I I wonder if at times, uh, perhaps, we we can be like Jonah. Uh, In our minds, we put restrictions, perhaps unconscious ones, on who we think God's grace can reach. And so perhaps we think God's grace is for that nice young family who who lived down the road. But God's grace is not for the drunk 
cursing at the top of his lungs as he staggers down the street at night. But friends, God's grace is, seeks out all kinds of people. It even seeks out Ninevites. Because his grace, you see, is for sinners. His grace is for sinners. Jesus didn't say he came to save the righteous. He said he came to save sinners. And Jesus was criticised by the upright, respectable folk for the kinds of people he hang, hung around with. But they were the very ones who listened and responded to him. Uh, I think John Newton captures it well in the hymn we sang at the start of the service. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see, God saves wretches. His grace is for wretches. Wretches like me. For as the psalmist said in, in Psalm 14, no one is righteous. No, not one. Well, that's Paul's paraphrase of Psalm 14. God's grace is for all kinds of sinners. And there's no one so bad that Jesus' death on the cross cannot pay for his or her sin. But the Ninevites do show us that for grace to be received, grace must deal with us. Grace must change us from the inside out. You see, grace cannot be received received by those who remain proud. Grace cannot be received by those who hold on to a fierce sense of their independence. Grace can't be received by those who insist on putting themselves at the centre of all things and whose own prosperity is their greatest good. Grace is for wretches who by grace, by grace, recognise that they are wretches who stand condemned before a holy God and being awakened to their need for forgiveness, they cry out to him to save them. Let's go back to Jonah. As Jonah fled from the Lord's command, notice the irony here. Jonah stood in need of the very same grace he feared would be shown to the people of Nineveh that he thought didn't deserve it. Jonah needed that same grace. And we see that God's grace didn't let go of Jonah, but it pursued him. God pursued Jonah in a ferocious storm at sea. He, he pursued Jonah as he was thrown overboard. He, he pursued Jonah as he was swallowed by a great fish. And his grace met Jonah in the belly of a giant fish, where in what I can only imagine is kind of the squishy, dank, smelly dark, washing around with all the other fish food, uh, that his life seemed to be fading away. It's there that Jonah called out to the Lord. And Jonah recalls, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. And then we learn at the end of chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 3, and the Lord spoke to the fish and had vomited Jonah out upon dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. That's grace. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, 
that great city and call out against it the message that I tell you. When Jonah fled, God could have let him go his merry way. God could have called another prophet to go to Nineveh, one who would be more obedient than Jonah. But in his love and mercy, God pursued Jonah and he recommissioned him. And Jonah obeyed God, even though Jonah still had things to learn about grace. Because you see in chapter 4, don't we see him sitting on a hill outside the city, still waiting for God's judgment to fall on it? Jonah still had things to learn about grace. But there was a change in Jonah. He willingly came under God's word. He heard what God said a second time. And he obeyed his instruction. Friends, we too have a long way to go, don't we? in God's sanctifying us in our understanding of grace, we've got a long way to go. There's a lot of progress still to be made in denying ourselves and following Jesus in living full out for God's glory. But in response to grace, trust we're moving in the right direction as we seek to live under the authority of God's word. Uh, Anthony Carter in his book uh, Running from Mercy says this in every church gathered in this world today people are either changing the gospel or the gospel is changing them one or the other is happening either the gospel message is transforming lives or people are deforming the gospel message. Uh, One of the characteristics of our church highlighted in the recent survey is uh, a love for God's word, uh, a strong desire to grow in it. I pray in God's grace we continue to be changed by the gospel, by his word, even perhaps especially in those places where his word chafes against us uncomfortably. Well, Jonah eventually made it to Nineveh and he proclaimed a simple message of judgment. We read it in chapter 3 and verse 4. He went around calling out, uh, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And as he moved through the city, a remarkable thing happened. We read, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Those words amazing to you? The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. What an amazing response, this pagan people, this fierce, warlike people who who threatened uh, Israel. They humbled themselves before God. It's only possible, the only explanation is God's grace. The only explanation is God's grace. Can you imagine this? This arrogant, bold, hardened people used to imposing their will on others, violently crushing those who stood between them and what they desired. They trembled. They trembled at the message. And the fact that they believed is nothing less than grace and it's nothing less than the evidence that God in love had been pursuing them all along just as Jonah feared he might. 
And in their response, uh, the people of Nineveh actually model for us what repentance is like. Uh, it's a response of the head and the, ha uh, the heart and the hands. We find out firstly that they changed uh, their mind about God and about themselves. Repentance involves a new perspective, a new way of seeing things. We become aware of the lies that we tell ourselves and we believe what God says is true. And friends, it only happens, it only ever happens by the renewing, convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul tells us, in, I won't quote it, but he tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14, without the Holy Spirit, we continue to think that the gospel is mere foolishness because we are unable to understand what is only spiritually discerned. So repentance involves a change of mind. It's a response of the head. But it's also a response of the heart. Uh, we read in verse three, in verse, chapter 3 and verse 5, in the second half, uh, they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Uh, the king issued a proclamation uh, in verses 7 and 8, that neither man nor beast taste anything. Let them be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. What's the significance of fasting here? Well, well fasting is a way of denying our natural needs in order to focus our hearts. Fasting is a heart response. We focus our hearts on what we desire most. And here, for this people, it is seeking God's forgiveness. Lastly, repentance involves the hands. Uh, the king declared in verse 8, Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. You see, what we believe is seen in how we live. James wrote, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Friends, true repentance involves a change in actions. It's not just saying sorry. It's not just asking for forgiveness, but it's beginning to live a life contrary to the life we lived before. As we now live not to satisfy ourselves, but to please God. Well, that happened at Nineveh. What was Jesus' verdict on the response of the Ninevites? Well, Jesus said the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. They repented at the, rep at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus says it was genuine. In Jonah... End of Jonah chapter 3, we read, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Of course, when we say God relented, we're not saying God changed his mind. What it's telling us is that God actually did what he designed to do all along, that this judgment was intended, this word of judgment was intended to bring repentance. And that's what it did. So God relented, turned away from that message of judgment because his desire all along had been to save them. 
Friends, how has God in his grace been speaking to you this morning? How's he been speaking to you? Uh, perhaps for some, uh, God has been pursuing you for some time with his salvation. Uh, if, if that's the case, won't you admit today that God is God and surrender to his love with your head and your heart and your hands. And friends, when you do, you'll find the fear of losing your freedom is not something you need to fear because your freedom is actually not freedom at all. It's bondage to something else. And he alone gives you the freedom to be what he created you to be. And in giving into his pursuit, you do not lose, but in fact you gain everything. You gain forgiveness, you gain a home in heaven, or new heavens and new earth. You gain a family of Christ, you gain peace. Above all, you gain Christ himself, who alone can fill the aching void in your heart. Or perhaps you are Christ's. But you've been resisting him in some way. Maybe uh, it's a sin that you've been holding on to. Maybe uh, it's some call from God on your life that you've been shying away from. Maybe there's some mess you've made that you just can't see a way out of. Maybe, like Jonah, you need to stop running and you need to let God be God. Dane Ortland, in his uh, book of a couple of years ago, and I commend it to you, uh, Gentle and Lowly, he says, if God sent his own son to walk through the valley of condemnation, rejection and hell, you can trust him as you walk through your own valleys on the way to heaven. He says, perhaps you have squandered his mercy and you know it. Do you know what Jesus does with those who squander his mercy? He pours out more mercy God is rich in mercy. That's the whole point. God is not tight-fisted with mercy, but open-handed. Not frugal, but lavish. Not poor, but rich. So he says, your regions of deeper shame and regret. There were his mercy reaches and his mercy abides. Our haunting shame, he says, is not a problem for him, but the very thing he loves to work with. And on that day, we stand before him. We will weep with relief, shocked at how impoverished a view we have had. Sorry, how impoverished a view of his mercy rich heart we had. Or perhaps today, uh, believer, you, you just need to be reminded, you just need to be encouraged that God's mercy is rich and his pursuing grace is irresistible. You need to know, again, uh, in the words of Dane Ortland, the father's tender care envelops with pursuing gentleness, sweetly governing every last detail of our lives. You need that solid place to rest your weight on 
as you go to your knees in prayer, perhaps for the salvation of your spouse, your child, your parent, your friend, perhaps even someone God's placed on your heart whom you've never met. Have confidence that his grace is grace to the wayward. It reaches, his grace reaches wherever he purposes. And so we pray with a certain hope that his grace, grace does indeed break down all resistance. And when he pursues to save, his grace always, always finds its mark. Friends, God testifies to himself in his word that he is rich in mercy. He is full of grace. Whatever your situation today, whatever your need, whatever the ache in your heart, whatever perhaps the mess you've got yourself in, May this be where you rest your hope that he is rich in mercy and may his grace be to you today something that is absolutely amazing. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a God who is rich in mercy. Your ways are unfathomable. And yet your heart is tender toward us. In Jesus, your son, you have pursued us. And you have opened up a way of salvation. Lord, as we reflect on our own hearts and lives, we confess that your grace is amazing. Grace is for us, the undeserving. Grace is for sinners. Your grace that flows richly, freely from your heart is for wretches. Lord, I pray that any who listen to this, who do not yet know your grace, that you would pursue them and bring them to true repentance. they may find that Jesus is what they've truly been looking for all along. Lord, where we are resisting you in some way or, or where we've made a mess of things, may, may we know your grace in our lives that reaches out to us even as we seek to go our own way uh, because you are the God whose grace comes to us again and again and again. And Father, where we long for your grace to reach the hearts of people we pray for, may we rest in that certainty that you are a God of mercy, 
and your grace where you send it is absolutely irresistible. You always accomplish what you desire. We thank you that we can rest in this. May this always be our hope. And Father, fill us with thanks in our hearts today and a fresh appreciation of the grace that is truly amazing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude singing together.